Welcome everyone to uh, this regular meeting um, of the Board of Education on Monday, April 26, 2021. Uh, this meeting has been appropriately advertised. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Cotter. You're mute. Sorry, I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Mr. Chu. Here. Mr. Craig. Here. Ms. Henry? Here. Ms. Mello? Here. Ms. Rivera? Here. Mrs. Severino? Here. Celia? Here. Mr. Stotts? No, I saw Bill. Bill? Sorry about that. I had right. off. Somebody turned it back on for me. Um, Mrs. Wood? Here. And Mrs. Caden? Here. Thank you. Uh, next, we will have the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, feel free to say it along with us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation. under God, God, indivisible, indivisible. With, liberty with liberty and justice for all. There is no executive session at this time, so we are moving. Do I have a motion, excuse me, to move into Committee of the Whole? So moved. And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, so this uh, month's Committee of the Whole, we are going to use um, to take some time to talk about, oh, I'm just noticing that that got switched. Did you want to do the budget presentation first during committee? Yeah, I figured I would do the, but I, and I apologize. I'll do okay. the budget presentation, then we'll go into committee of the whole, and um, I can answer um, any of um, your lingering budget questions, and then we can talk about the school reopening plan kind of all at the same time. So is it fine to just stay in committee of the whole, because then we can ask the questions at the end of your presentation anyway? Yep. That's fine. Okay. So we'll just, we'll just stay in for the budget presentation, and then for our, our school uh, reopening update as well. Yep. All right. So thank you, Mrs. Coleman. Um, do we have a motion for it or might as well do it now? Yeah, I think we did do it, but what, I'm sorry, we, I didn't hear. That's okay. We'll do it again. Um, do we have a motion to go into committee of the whole? So, so moved. I think it was Clinton. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and a second. Second. Got it. Area. Got it. Thank All you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. There we go. Thank you. So I did attach the uh, PowerPoint budget presentation um, so the community can see it. Um, there have been no changes since last month, but if the community didn't um, didn't see it last month, it is here and I can put it on the district website um, tomorrow morning or this evening, um, whichever works for the board. Um, but just to recap the 2021-2022 school district budget, um, but the school budget, school district budget is a board policy, it's your largest board policy probably the most important board policy um, that you will uh, set every single school year. Um, so that being said, uh, a look ahead into next school year um, with regards to services, um, support and expanding or ongoing mental health services going into next school year. We're maintaining all existing um, positions um, and we are restructuring the leadership um, to increase the uh, level of school support. We're looking into the new federal stimulus um, funds to complete some uh, much needed facility um, updates in the district. Um, more to come on that um, in the coming months. Enrichment, we're looking to included with um, the additional federal funds that we're due to get. We're looking to um, support extended learning opportunities for our children um, and provide some ac academic enrichment for them. And we're going to be undergoing um, long-term planning and strategic planning with um, um, equity at its core. And that, that work will be uh, beginning. Um, so all things said, what you're going to be approving tonight, total budget, uh, $36,678,310. That is your general fund budget. Um, and it's made up, um, as far as your revenues, from these uh, following sources, 47.6% is local tax levy, less than 30% is state aid, about 15% is tuition, 
And then the rest is made up of fund balance, which is basically money that um, we're able to save um, um, throughout the years and some miscellaneous um, incomes that we earn. And that's, we earn that through shared services um, and interest and some investments. Expenses, just a little recap here. So 65% of the funds that we spend in Collingswood um, go towards direct instruction to the children. An additional 14% is for um, student services. That's including guidance services, nursing services, child study team services, OTPT speech. 9% um, of the budget um, is ad administration cost. And that's obviously myself, the superintendent, principals, supervisors, um, directors, and then 12% is facilities. So what everybody wants to know, so last year's tax levy was 17,123,325. Next year's tax levy, 17,465,792 for a difference of 342,000 or what everyone wants to know, um, $70.61 on the average home. And the average home uh, is 231,000 in Collingswood. And the way we generate fund balance that we can then put back into our budget in the form of savings, um, here's a list of all the cost savings measures that we do employ in Collingswood. It's pretty much an all-inclusive list, but pretty much anything is on the table. We do a lot of shared services, a lot with Oak Glen, um, but we also do shared services in our surrounding uh, districts and the county. Um, we have a lot of um, maintenance folks that are certified, which some of our smaller districts in the area cannot afford. Um, in their tiny budget, so we're able to, to send our, our people out and make a little uh, money off of that. Um, and uh, insurance, uh, we are um, in joint insurance funds for both, both uh, types of insurance. That's your non-health and all of your health lines of insurance. So we do see savings um, each year as a result of all of these things. And that is it. I kept it very brief, um, getting basically to the nuts and bolts of what everybody wants to know, because I think... Um, the more important, I should say more important, but talking about the opening of school is really, with everything that's going on, um, it's gonna take the crux of the discussion tonight. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna, you guys can see the agenda, correct? As I'm paging through it. All right, yeah. all, right. Um, all right, so the school reopening plan update, uh, Dr. McDowell, let me, See if I can make you a co-host. So you can share your screen, okay? okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, you should be able to. I'm gonna stop sharing mine so you can share yours. Okay. Okay. There's an echo when Dr. McCall speaks. I'm not sure if devices. Yeah, I'm hearing that too. How about now? Is that better? Okay. Right. Okay. So I am going to share my screen. Okay. Can we all see the screen? Yes. Yes, okay. sir. Okay. So we believe that it's important to give a status update on where we are uh, with regards to uh, continued expansion um, as it relates to school reopening. We wanted to start by being grounded in the same, in the consistent language. Our mission um, as a district uh, is to inspire confidence, critical thinking, creativity, and perseverance with our long-term vision is to develop lifelong learners by providing inspiring and challenging content for every student. So I want to restate um, uh, again what our district goal is. Our district goal is to return to full-time in-person instruction September of 2021. And there's a few things that we are uh, focused on in order to get us to that particular process. So the same way that we phased in uh, uh, from being in a, uh, a full remote environment, uh, we're also going to be phasing in to a full back to uh, in-person environment. We established a few goals for reopening for April. One was to reconfigure our classrooms in order to support more students in person. 
Two was to improve our uh, multi-tiered system of support processes to make sure that we were identifying um, the level of need by student. Three was to revise the learning schedule with an emphasis on increased direct instruction. And four was to invite as many students back based on the capacity of each of our buildings. So in terms of the reconfiguration of classrooms, initial um, assessments were conducted this past summer uh, based on the six foot rule. Classrooms were reassessed in February and early March, uh, and then they were reassessed again in April in order to accommodate uh, the change in physical distancing guidelines of three feet. So uh, as a result, classroom capacity was dramatically enhanced. In addition, we made sure that as a district, we purchased the appropriate COVID-related materials in order to account for the increase in students, which included personal protective equipment, cleaning products, additional filters, both for air as well as odor, uh, in addition to uh, plexiglass shields, to be able to provide families and staff the option, even though um, the CDC guidance uh, uh, gave some flexibility in terms of the usage of the shields, we still wanted to make them readily available for uh, families and for staff members who felt more comfortable, even with the reduced spacing. And then in addition to maintaining the increase of cleaning throughout the day with the electrostatic sprayers to be able to touch the high touch areas every 30 minutes on campus, uh, and then making sure that there was a thorough cleaning and disinfectant process at night. As of April um, 26th, all classrooms have been reconfigured um, based on the partnership between our buildings and grounds team, as well as our building administrators. New desk shields arrived over spring break and then were distributed and installed as needed. HVAC equipment continues uh, to receive daily preventative maintenance and filters are changed um, as required. Uh, the remaining MERV 13 filters are scheduled to arrive next week and will be installed in the designated areas. And then the daily cleaning protocols uh, were reviewed um, with all of our custodial staff to make sure that there was consistent practice from campus to campus. In terms of the improvement around our multi-tier system of support, uh, as a district, we have used this approach to identify students who were struggling academically, socially, or emotionally. Schools categorize students based on a three-tier system and then refer to this data in order to uh, provide students additional access to in-person instruction. So we analyzed the data and based on the tiers that determined whether or not students participated in rotating three days uh, or up to five days per week of in-person instruction. We also revised our learning schedule um, in order to place greater levels of emphasis on uh, direct instruction. And that took place uh, over, uh, over the last several weeks with an emphasis on balanced literacy, breaking down um, the reading and the writing block with an emphasis on making sure that there was more uh, direct contact between students and teachers, but also opportunities for independent practice. In addition to um, revising our math program as well as social studies and science, and then also looking at our specials um, in order to be able to increase student level of engagement. But then we also took it a step further and then we uh, focused on revising the way in which our academic support teachers and interventionists engage with students who continue to struggle by reinforcing concepts during the school day and then also offering additional office hours for students who still needed assistance. So the gradual release of, a, of responsibility is really focused on I do, we do, and then you do. Um, and so that was one of the areas that we really wanted to, to drill down on in this new iteration of the learning schedule. As of April 26th, um, we uh, were able to significantly increase the number of students participating. You can see um, the breakdown of students participating in five days of in-person instruction per week, the students that are rotating uh, three days of in-person instruction, and then the students who opted to continue <laughs> participating in a fully remote environment. Every school has different capacity. And as of today, uh, we still have uh, classroom availability in Garfield, Oakland School, Newby, Sharp, Tatum, Zane North, 
and the high school. Uh, we have currently reached uh, in-person capacity for the middle school. The middle school and the high school, based on our transmission rate, are currently uh, participating in the six foot social distancing requirements, whereas our elementary schools are participating in the three foot social distancing guidelines. Uh, but we do have uh, additional space in uh, every school with exception of the middle school. Families wishing to increase access to in-person instruction should follow up directly with their child's school this week. What are our priorities for uh, restarting and reinventing school in the fall? Um, we have been uh, looking at the 10 priorities outlined by the Learning Policy Institute, uh, which focuses on a fundamental shift in academic, social, emotional, and community-based support. And of the 10 categories, um, this is how we are uh, uh, using to inform our planning. So under the closing of the digital divide, ensuring that all students have access to the digital tools, Further engagement and discussion is needed in order to assess future purchases of instructional materials. Uh, however, we do have additional funding that's coming in thanks to the ESSER II and the ESSER III funds to be able to account uh, for the growing need um, of our students as we dig deeper into our planning at the school-based level. Uh, number two, strengthening distance and blended learning, keeping teachers up to speed on new technologies and teaching strategies and the skills needed uh, to transition back to full-time in-person learning and recognizing that there will be a cadre of students uh, for whom remote learning was successful. And we wanna make sure that the opportunity is still present for families that are uncomfortable uh, with the full return to in-person instruction. Uh, assessing what students need. Um, this takes on many forms. Currently we're operating using a multi-tiered system of support in each school. Uh, but after sampling several of the adaptive systems to assess the strength of our students and their learning needs, uh, we have found the most success with Imagine Math and Common Lit. Both are products that offer benchmark capabilities uh, while providing uh, value to day-to-day -day routine instruction. The Start Strong assessment will be administered in the fall and will be based on prior year academic standards. It will be available in English Language Arts grades four through 10, and math grades four through eight, algebra, geometry, and algebra two, and then science in grades six, nine, and 12. This data will help to inform uh, educator planning um, and then ultimately student level support in order to address unfinished learning and unconfirmed learning in each and every school. Number four consists of ensuring that there are supports in place uh, for social and emotional learning. Um, SEL uh, has been a very active part of the curriculum in Collinswood and Oakland. Uh, Pre-pandemic, uh, we increased our, our impact of SEL, um, which was established as a long-term goal for the district. We invested in training and trauma-informed practices as well as restorative approaches. The taxpayers in Collinswood approved a ballot question to provide us additional resources to expand mental health uh, in our schools. In tier one of that plan, was the implementation of social emotional learning in uh, all grades pre, uh, pre K through five. And then um, uh, a program that was collaboratively developed between both of our school districts among our teaching staff, as well as our counseling staff, the summer of 2020. A counseling coordinator was hired in order to provide support to teachers and families and also to coordinate services. And then ultimately uh, to remove barriers. In addition to a partnership with Jefferson Behavioral Health, uh, which has been a supplement to school-based services and then breaking down some of those barriers that stand between uh, students and what they need academically. Currently options are also being explored um, in our Oakland campus as well as moving forward, we're seeking to expand this level of support in middle and high school. Also looking to redesign schools for stronger relationships. So in our school district, the topic of relationships has been at the forefront of all of our school-based initiatives. The upcoming challenge uh, will be to build upon the solid foundation of relationships by transitioning from being socially distant uh, to close proximity, and then reestablishing the bonds um, consistent with that of a tight school community. What this means is, is that the first marking term um, of the new school year will need to look and feel and be different uh, with an emphasis on students re-engaging and reconnecting um, with each other, 
with the staff and with their school. Uh, number six focuses on authentic, uh, culturally responsive learning. This is an area where there has been significant investment within our district, um, but our, our educators need additional time to learn, grow, and then reflect, as well as update their practices based on us getting to that next normal. Um, the district will continue to invest and build upon the uh, trauma-informed practices and the restorative justice work. Um, trauma has been something um, that our educators have been more than willing to take on and learn about and, it, and understand its impact on student learning. Restorative practices help uh, students to build a sense of resilience, accountability, and advocacy. Um, so there has been system-wide embrace among our educators around these concepts. Uh, we will need to continue having conversations as it relate to race and social justice and its impact uh, on our country as well as the local community. In addition to providing professional learning opportunities for our, uh, our colleagues to engage in continued transformative equity work. Uh, we will be building off of the activities um, originally performed by the District Equity Committee uh, over the last several years and the Equity Councils and the Anti-Racist Committee's work from this year it will all come together and serve as a foundation for strategic planning in the fall. We're also planning for um, expanded um, learning time. This is an area where we've taken initial steps in order to make progress, but we need continued work. Uh, in years past, we offered uh, STEM-based summer programs. Through Title I, we also offered expanded learning beyond the school day and beyond the school year. Uh, Collingswood Middle School participated in an arts and education grant, which also expanded the learning time uh, in our underserved uh, student populations. Due to the challenges associated with COVID-19, summer programming will look and feel different. Uh, we will be focusing on reconnecting students with schools, uh, and then school teams will be meeting throughout uh, the remainder of this school year to also identify additional supports students and families will need in the fall. We will continue our pursuit uh, to focus on establishment of uh, community schools with targeted wraparound supports. Uh, this is an area that needs further investment. School teams will be tasked with identifying gaps to address at each school between now uh, and the end of this current school year, which would be June 17th. We have elements of community schools within our district, but additional supports are needed to actually form true community schools. We have community outreach embedded in our preschool programs, but we need to better align our efforts so that it supports the entire district. Our mental health partnership provides wraparound services for students and families and will be critical as we think about uh, full reopening in September. In addition, uh, food service being provided during the pandemic, regardless of eligibility, has also been helpful to families. And we, uh, we found out last week that this will be continuing through June 30th of 2022. One less barrier uh, for families undergoing uh, challenges due to COVID-19. Uh, preparing our educators for the reinvention of school. One of the fundamental goals of, as we enter and think about moving beyond the, uh, the ramifications of the pandemic will be to make sure that we emerge through this crisis stronger than, the, than when we entered. Uh, in our rush to get back to normal, let's not forget about the parts that are not worth rushing back to. Um, our educators have tackled a very wide range of challenge. We've integrated social emotional learning into our practice and emphasis has been placed on building and strengthening students for full-time in-person instruction. But we also have to make sure that our educators have the tools and the resources in order to ensure that students are ready to learn uh, with an all hands on deck approach. And the last area within this priority uh, is leveraging resources and funding. School funding in New Jersey is largely predictable based on its funding formula. Um, however, uh, there are in many cases uh, uh, losses and sometimes wins dependent on the configuration uh, of your resources. So as a district, we have kind of straddled that line for the last several years. Uh, and taking a small hit in some areas and seeing a small win in, in, in some, we did see a modest increase in terms of our state aid this year, uh, which has been uh, redirected back into classrooms. However, some of the needs that have emerged as it relates to, uh, to the pandemic, uh, we will be significantly leveraging the resources 
coming in from the CARES Act money, as well as the American Rescue Plan funds in order to um, ensure that students as well as staff have what they need. We'll also need to continue looking for potential cost saving measures and beyond those that we've already established in order to make sure that once these grant funds run out, we're able to maintain consistency of, of service. So the shared agreements are, be, are helpful now, um, uh, but we don't want to uh, be overly reliant on funds that we know have an expiration date. So we will continue to uh, uh, focus on being fiscally responsible. So with the ESSER II funds, um, these funds are being provided uh, for areas most impacted by the disruption and the closure of schools. Um, areas uh, include evidence-based strategies to cultivate growth mindset, professional learning, formative assessment, the use of extended instructional time and targeted intervention for students, and then ultimately uh, uh, parental and family involvement through a multi-tiered system of support. So we will also be using these funds for robust summer programming, which you'll hear about in, in, in just a moment, as well as staff development and ultimately infrastructure all things related to air quality, airflow, uh, and so forth. The ESSER III funds or the American Rescue Act funds are really meant to help support and address the impact of significant interrupted instruction. Uh, preparation for physical reopening, the testing, repairs, and upgrade of projects to improve air quality within buildings, additional educational technology, uh, as well as mental health supports. We will be receiving additional guidance from the federal government within the next several weeks, uh, and we will be releasing um, uh, those plans very soon. So what's next? Right now, our focus is graduation, Thursday, June 24th. We currently have 187 seniors, and our goal is to make sure that we have 187 seniors walk across the stage. We currently have 12 students off track. They're working closely with the uh, educators at the high school campus and their families in order to uh, hit that, that target. Some of the areas where our students are currently projected to go post-graduation, 44% um, um, are moving to four-year colleges, 25.8 two-year colleges, six and a half are looking at trade or vocational schools. Uh, almost 2% are looking at the military and 10% are seeking to join the workforce. In addition, we're actively planning uh, and we'll be releasing uh, additional information this week regarding summer programming. We have two strands of summer programming which will be offered August 9th through the 12th and August 16th through the 19th. We have a K through four adventure camp which will be focused on connecting current kindergarten through fourth grade students with each other, their teachers and the local community, and really trying to uh, reignite that love of learning. Campers will have the opportunity to learn about themselves and growing in confidence as they interact with student mentors in an immersive environment where they learn about the local environment through hands-on activities and lessons from local experts. And our secondary camp, which will really be targeted and focused on students uh, grades six, grades nine, and grade 10. So rising into the middle school as well as the high school. Uh, this program will be like a, uh, a camp-like summer program focusing on bringing students together in order to reconnect. And a variety of activities uh, will be placed with senior leaders on hand in order to oversee the program. It'll include guest speakers, snacks, um, hands-on tasks, relationship buildings, and we will run separate programs for the middle school as well as the high school with our focus being on incoming sixth grade students entering into the middle school space. So transitioning from elementary um, to now having eight teachers. And then looking at our current ninth graders and our rising ninth graders whose introduction to the high school space uh, was less than traditional. Uh, so making sure that those students are prepared um, to be successful um, in a fully immersive high school environment. In terms of our planning, our goal uh, is to return to full-time in-person instruction in September. Uh, in order to do this, we will be leveraging the uh, expertise of our public health officials, 
um, both locally, countywide, and at the state level, continuing to follow the science in a measured way and balancing the guidance based on the needs of our community. We're gonna do this in two ways. Um, we will be leveraging the expertise of our outstanding school nurses in terms of the safety plan, but we will also uh, be leveraging the expertise of a group um, of a health advisory group that is comprised of Collingswood parents who are um, mental health professionals, uh, uh, clinicians, public health specialists, pediatricians, and medical professionals that have all agreed to volunteer their time in order to help us think through what does all of this uh, information and this guidance mean for us here in Collingswood. In addition to empowering our educators, between now and uh, the beginning of June, we will be uh, engaging in every school in school-based planning, one focused on the updating of safety protocols at the school level, and then the second will be school-based planning on instruction with the guiding question, what does the first marking term look like? And then how do we appropriately build relationships, re-engage and reconnect our students uh, to their school? We'll be using data in order to determine the appropriate social emotional learning needs uh, for students. And then we'll also be using data in order to identify specifically where students are academically and then identifying the strategies and resources to address unfinished learning. We'll also be engaging in uh, professional learning opportunities in order to make sure that our educators have what they need with an emphasis on trauma-informed care, social emotional learning, restorative practices, as well as student engagement. In terms of staffing, our emphasis and staffing will be, to, will be to be fully staffed by July 1st. One of the unfortunate casualties uh, of the COVID-19 crisis was that during the shutdown, we lost the majority of our cafeteria workers. One of the primary reasons why we have been unable to reopen our cafeterias, we, did not, we do not currently have the staff to open our cafeterias, which presented um, a logistical challenge to, to try to offer food service without staff. Uh, we are currently uh, on pace to be fully staffed within our cafeterias by July 1, which will remove that as a potential barrier uh, to uh, full-time in-person instruction in the fall. Uh, the same goes for our instructional staff. Uh, there was a reduction in instructional staff for what was deemed um, uh, non-priority areas based on the shutdown. Uh, we will be fully staffed uh, and uh, focused on caring, compassionate, and competent educators who will be welcoming back our students. So that will also be a, an area of emphasis between now and July 1st. In addition to identifying resources for families and caregivers uh, to assist with the transition back to full-time in-person instruction, with the understanding is that we do have a percentage of students and families that have not stepped foot in, in a school in 18 months. We know that there will be some level of reservation, some level of anxiety, uh, and then support and strategies and resources to make that transition as painless as possible will be necessary. And then identifying the appropriate solutions for families with continued reservation about returning to full-time in-person instruction uh, with the development of some option for families who are currently uh, participating remote with the understanding that the majority of our students will be back on campus in person and that the current structure of remote learning will not persist moving into the fall. It will be a new structure to address the smaller percentage of families that have indicated the desire to remain in a remote or virtual uh, or homebound environment based on uh, either medical needs, um, or, or whatever the, 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 the rationale that, uh, that families have based on that decision and based on that choice. In August, uh, it is our plan to uh, release the full uh, reopening plan for families to consume uh, for the month of August leading up to uh, the first day of school, which will be September 7th. Uh, so early August, uh, we will be releasing the full comprehensive plan, plan broken down by school um, for the community to be able to absorb, to be able to ask questions, to be able to reach out at the local school level uh, so that 
uh, families and caregivers feel comfortable about all of the plans and preparations that are being put in place in order to welcome students back uh, to full-time in-person instruction. That, uh, that concludes the update. Thank you, Dr. McDowell. That was um, really thorough and uh, very much appreciate all of that information. Um, I, I wanted to do this during Committee of the Whole so that board members could uh, take the time to ask some questions, some clarifying questions and that sort of thing. Um, I was gonna start it off, but um, other board members, please feel free to unmute yourselves and, and ask some questions too. But I just wanted to, to start off by a few really quick clarifying um, questions for the fall, because I think that um, the more times we repeat it, probably the better it will be. Um, the first one being, parents and students can expect that when they go into school in the fall, and teachers, I should say, should expect when they go into school in the fall, the teachers will not be teaching to students in their classroom and students on a computer simultaneously, correct? That is correct. So the, the option for remote that, that we will be creating will be a different separate option for, for remote students. That's correct. Um, great. And um, the summer programming question I had was, is that will this be open to all students who like, like ones that we've had in the past where like the STEAM camps that anybody could sign up for these in August or is it sort of students who have been deemed um, needing that extra support? So the way that um, we, left, we left it open because we wanted to make sure that students had the opportunity. So the only guiding principles was that they needed to be engaging and they needed to be in person as a means of transitioning students back within their schools. So there will be a, um, a, an interest survey uh, sent out to the community on Wednesday, uh, indicating your desire to participate in one or both sessions, uh, uh, whether you're in the elementary or the secondary program. So based on that level of interest, that determines the number of staffing um, that we would have. Um, but right now it's, it's completely open. There will be students separate and apart from this program uh, participating in extended school year. Mm -hmm. So our special education students who require um, additional time will have uh, uh, the ESY program in addition to this as an opportunity. And I thought it was great that the for the secondary ones, it's ninth and 10th since both of them had Kind of a rocky start. Is that also true for the middle school? It would be incoming sixth graders and exiting sixth graders or? Well, it, right now the focus would be incoming sixth graders. So okay. current fifth graders okay. um, with the understanding that at the middle school level, they still have two additional years. Right. Um, we know that the timeline of high school um, is a bit more accelerated. So we didn't want students who were current ninth graders um, to fall to to uh, fall behind, and we didn't want students uh, who were moving into high school to not have the appropriate level of expectation for what they're going to be walking into. That makes sense. I'm going to stop asking questions so that if other board members have one, that they can. I see Sarah with her hand raised. <laughs> Being very obedient today, I um, just wonder if you have any information from the high school level. That's a really low percentage of students returning to school. I have one anecdote about that, but I'm interested in what you're hearing um, about why the percentage is so low at the high school level. And I'm wondering how that might influence the rethinking, uh, reinventing schools in the fall. Right, so with our, our older students, um, it really boils down, I've, I've, what I've been able to glean when I talk with groups of high school students is that school did not feel like school in this environment. And that if they were, if they, if they had the ability to receive their academic content without having to wake up early, without having to uh, not wear their pajamas, um, but still had levels of access to their friends, and then direct access to their teachers, this was a choice um, that our secondary students have made. Uh, we're happy to see that there's been an increase. Um, we saw an increase of about 120 uh, of our uh, high school students that went from full remote to hybrid. Um, 
Most of them are seniors because the, the, the seniors are really trying to salvage that last hurrah in terms of their senior year, especially with senior activities and, and prom and, and, and so forth. So, but the overwhelming majority of the students uh, decided to stay in the remote environment because the, the environment that they were walking into did not feel like school. So one of the tasks that the high school staff will be charged with um, is reestablishing the feel of school um, for the fall. Some of the feel of school that my, my N of one <laughs> might say is they've really appreciated having a lot more autonomy. So I'm hoping that maybe as we welcome them back and what feels like school might take some of that into account for students Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Mary and then Heidi, <laughs> try to do it this way. I have a few questions. The first question the when you said this with the phasing in, but like we're phasing um, students back in, that will be completed by the end of this school year so that we'll be ready in September for full reopening. That's correct. Okay. Um, I have another uh, question and that was that as we focus, you were talking about the beginning of the school year in September and the need to obviously fully engage all learners um, and you know with each other, with school and all of those really important critical things. I'm, I'm just asking, will curriculum still be able to keep on pace if we're devoting you know, the time to doing those important things? Um, we're still con you know, committed to keeping the curriculum on pace. So that's, that's, that's a great question. Um, and I'm getting ready to give you a very convoluted answer. Um, so as an educator, the, the premise around pacing guides is really based on where students begin. So the most important component is reestablishing the sense of trust and, and the safety with students. Um, the start strong assessments will help give us uh, um, an idea on what level um, of rigor to begin introducing to students and then versus what level of remediation while still exposing children to grade level content throughout the school year. It's, it's my belief that if we take the time on the front end to rebuild and establish those relationships, we will be able to recapture some of that ground loss within that first marking term, but failure to build those relationships and reestablish those connections um, I believe will be a continued struggle for the remainder of the school year, and we won't have the ability to catch up. Uh, so we'll be working very closely with all of our educators because this next phase um, really requires a tailored and customized approach at every school based on the needs of their students. So we want our educators on each campus to be fully involved in the development of what that instructional plan looks like at each school. And then the district will provide uh, support and resources for each school to implement that plan. Okay, I just have one last question um, that builds on something you just shared. So with regards to the needs that are presented um, for individual students, groups of students at specific schools, um, is the thought that the, since the SR funds are three years, um, to be used over three years, is the thought that then the remediation that you talked about could also, like programs for, will be developed to do simultaneously during the school year so that those students are getting additional supports? Students who come in presenting a need. Yes. Um, so we're looking, we're not looking at an either or approach. We're actually looking at a yes and. Um, so we have the funds available for extended learning time. Identifying the extent of what that looks like, um, that's, that's that level of work that's gonna, that has to happen at the school level, um, but there are funds in order to be able to do that. Thank you. So Heidi and then Clinton and Siri, I see your, your virtual hands raised, which is very helpful, thank you. <laughs> so Heidi, go ahead. You're still muted. Sorry. No worries. Uh, my question obviously is the engagement, um, involvement, communication to the Woodland students. What are the plans there? 
So we're working, um, we're working with um, Woodland representatives. Um, we also have a, a family uh, liaison that works pretty uh, heavily in the Woodland area. Um, I actually met with, with her uh, this afternoon. Um, we will be engaging um, Woodland students and their families in Woodland uh, this summer, uh, in addition to uh, at the high school and then traditional means. So I think that um, we won't be singling out, but I, I do believe that we need to make sure that we're providing appropriate uh, attention um, and opportunities to engage. So yes, the, the Woodland community will be engaged differently, uh, but directly. I'm just concerned, like you said, a lot of these children have not been in a school in a long time, and now they're going over to the high school. It's going to be very scary for them. Mm -hmm. We're also working closely with uh, Superintendent uh, Walters uh, at the Woodland School. Um, so we're looking to um, increase that partnership this summer, as well as moving into the fall in order to make sure that we don't lose children. Thank you. And Dr. McDowell, would um, incoming um, Woodland students into the ninth grade, they would be able to participate in that summer programming as well, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Um, okay, so I don't remember between Clinton and Syria. I think it was Clinton who had it, who I saw his hand was up first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. McDowell, you had said that you, you know, we had some issues or concerns with staffing in the cafeterias. Um, how, how is the, I, mean, I have concerns about staffing overall. Um, I've been reading significant articles about early retirements and people leaving the field in general. Like, what is your sense on how we're going to look, you know, over the summer and then into September? For, for just having the teaching force in place and ready to go? It's a great question. So we are already uh, receiving um, retirements, uh, resignations, and then just life transitions. I, I would say that that's the normal ebbs and flows of the year. One of the things that uh, we are very fortunate to have is we have a cadre of, uh, of student teachers as well as uh, full-time subs who are also available um, and have uh, uh, intimate knowledge of our school district. Uh, we will be leveraging those relationships to be able to fill some of the gaps while still posting uh, for some of the vacancies that come up now and also throughout the summer. And we're just gonna take a very aggressive approach to making sure that we're fully staffed. Um, I think that um, we are one of the districts that uh, uh, has a work culture that is very uh, inviting. So um, I'm hopeful, I may be naive, but I'm hopeful that we will be fully staffed uh, moving into the early part of the summer uh, and that we should be okay uh, in September. One of the areas that we're also contemplating is some of the part-time and some of the uh, 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 supplemental staff needs that may uh, uh, present themselves after we've dug a bit deeper into the data, uh, we'll be working closely with our business administrator and the finance team, and then leveraging some of the resources coming in from the grants in order to address those supplemental needs as well. Um, I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, Syria? Good evening. Um, two questions. We recently hired a translator um, I'm wondering if it would be uh, possible to translate the reopening plan for the Spanish speaking families. That would be my, my plan as well. And as far as, and I understand that teachers won't be simultaneously teaching um, both in person and virtual or remote students. Uh, we don't have virtual students, <laughs> um, but is that capacity, that new capacity coming from hires that we're making over the summer? And if so, if we don't get the hires we hope to have, do we have a plan B for still offering something remote for those families who aren't comfortable coming back in the fall? 
Well, the first is for us to actually assess um, the comfort level. Um, so right now we have uh, we have rough estimates. Uh, we will be sending out a new data collection instrument within the next several weeks. One, um, we'll be asking some questions related to the remote piece, but the majority of the questions that, that will be asked of our families and our caregivers will be around the, uh, the new environment uh, for the fall. And then that will also be used to help inform the planning at the school-based level. So right now, um, we have anecdotal data about the percentage of who we will need to plan for. We have also put in several calls at the state because we need additional clarity um, on the governor's proclamation about remote instruction for the fall. Um, we're hoping within the next several weeks to have all of this information uh, and then be able to start planning around that. So we really don't know if we need to hire for this until that's clear. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, Matt? Yep. Thank you, Dr. McDowell. And this is kind of going along with uh, with Sarah's question earlier and a little bit of what you're saying with this information that we're gathering, thinking about our 10th and 11th graders right now and wanting to make sure that we're, we have as many in person in high school. When will we know the number of high schoolers that are planning to, to go back in person and what can what will the district be doing to potentially drive that number up if we're seeing a lot or opting for remote? You mean currently or for the fall? For the fall. So in waiting for the, the, the guidance around the qualifications around the remote piece, it's my understanding um, just based on statements that have, have come from some of the, the uh, Department of Ed officials that um, students that or families that have indicated that it is medically necessary um, will fall under that category. But in terms of it being um, readily available in mass quantities, we're not planning for that. Uh, we don't anticipate that being a, a, a major issue at the high school level um, once, we, uh, once we get down, down to that path. Um, but there are families who do have serious medical concerns um, that are really driving the need for us to plan around this. Um, and that, and so that right now, that, that's about the most that we can... Uh, we can speculate until we get further guidance from the Department of Education. Matt, did you have another question or was that, you're good? No, that was it. Oh, Thank I saw you. you took your hand down. Okay. <laughs> um, Chris had raised her hand, but not virtually, and then Roger. <laughs> so Chris, go ahead. Um, my questions had a lot to do with what Syria and Matt were just talking about when it comes to the possibility about the fall. So is everything on the table? Like the, the Department of Ed may mandate that students who elect it, we, would we have to keep them in district or are they, is the Department of Ed even thinking about outsourcing that to an all remote school? Um, or do we not know yet? They've been very tight-lipped on the options that will be made available. We know that there will be some option. Um, they, they have just not provided the details of yeah. what will be allowable. Okay. Um, just two quick questions too. Just um, you mentioned an extended school year for certain students. Have those families been notified yet, or is this still in the planning stages of finding out uh, and identifying what what children will be able to take advantage of that due to need? Well, ESY is part of the IEP process. Um, okay. So students who are currently receiving services aligned to their IEP, um, they're in active discussion with their caseworker and the special education department. Um, and they, and they they will be formally notified of uh, whether or not they qualify for extended school year services. Generally, students that have met all of their targets um, and are not in danger of um, uh, uh, of falling of falling back um, don't qualify for ESY. Those who are in danger of not being able to maintain the progress made during the school year generally qualify for ESY. Uh, but that will be a determination based on the child study team and the special education department in concert in partnership with parents and caregivers. Okay. One other quick question and then I'm done. Um, you said that there's capacity in every school but the middle school for additional in-person learning. Um, any idea of how much, like should we all be online now to try to get our kids in five days a week? Is it gonna fill up fast? Uh, what are you seeing numbers wise? 
Well, I can give you an, 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 uh, an example. So when we look at uh, Garfield School, 78% of their population um, are participating five days a week. They are at roughly 85% um, capacity with that number of students. So right now, school leaders are reaching out uh, to families who are still in that remote environment with the goal of trying to move as many families from the remote to some form of in-person instruction. Uh, families that are, are interested in coming back for five days, that is an option. Um, but the, the minimum that we are seeking right now is to, to transfer as many students out of the remote space to some form, either the hybrid or, or the full week. So that's really what's taking place now. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Roger. Thank you. Um, jumping off of Chris's question, with all the schools having passed except for middle school, does that mean that at least at the moment, um, all the families who had indicated they wanted, wanted to be five days in person uh, are getting five days in person? That's my understanding. Okay. Um, and then thinking about uh, preparing for fall 2021, uh, and, and you're discussing how um, the schools and the, and the teachers will have to really rethink uh, what school might look like in fall 2021. Uh, what's the support uh, and, and, and training and professional development uh, going to look like for teachers to, to help prepare them um, going into to fall 2021? Is it just like a few days before the school, dis school opens or is there a larger plan there? So right now we have scheduled, we have an administrative retreat scheduled for next week. Um, we will be solidifying what some of those plans are to go back to schools. We will also be collecting data from the schools um, uh, in terms of our educators in order to identify specifically what they need. And then we'll be thinking about what that professional development plan looks like during the summer, what it looks like at the beginning of the school year, and then ultimately what it looks like in terms of reinforcement throughout the school year. So we, we fully acknowledge that our educators are um, exhausted. So trying to front load a whole bunch of content all at one time is not necessarily going to have the type of effect that we're looking for. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at striking a balance between what's the most imp uh, important information that they need at the, during the summer, most important information that they need at the beginning of the year, and then what can we take a bit more time uh, in order to establish? Okay, awesome. And then one last question. Uh, my understanding was uh, last summer, Dr. Oswald's frustration uh, had held some frustration with the state in terms of how long it took them to come out with any guidelines to help guide you know, school districts. Are we expecting uh, more concrete guidelines to come out from the state in terms of uh, what fall 2021 will look like? And if we are, do you, do you have any idea of when those guidelines might come out? Right now we're planning um, for full-time in-person instruction. And if we need to pivot, we will, um, but we can't wait for the state in order to, to plan. Um, so we're going really full steam ahead, trying to identify what works for Collingswood and Oakland. Um, in the absence of formal guidance, we have to do um, uh, what's in the best interest of our students. So that's, that's really the approach that we're taking um, here at this, at this point. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Dr. McDowell, I had a, another question based on um, what a couple of other people had brought up thinking about spacing and um, capacity. So we're in the elementary schools, not quite at, at full capacity yet with the three feet distancing guidelines. And I know based on our, uh, the meeting that, that I was in that had the um, public health professionals, they were kind of leading us to, not leading us to believe, I don't want to say it that way. They were saying, you know, if trends went similar to last summer, that our community transmission numbers would get much lower than they are right now during the summer. And hopefully because of vaccines will stay lower in the fall, which would hopefully mean that the, that the distancing guidelines in general would not need to be a mitigation strategy. It would just need to be masking. So fitting everybody into a classroom is not as big of an issue. If that, sorry about that, if that doesn't happen for, for whatever reason, how are we in terms of space for fitting the percentage of remote students that may currently be opting to stay remote, but next year would go back? How are we going to, to work on space issues if 
distancing is a thing that needs to happen? Well, I, I don't necessarily want to introduce trouble that doesn't that's not here yet. Mm -hmm. um, right now, if you look at the long term trend um, with um, transmission rates, with vaccination rates, with herd immunity and with the, the general direction of the guidance, um, we do not envision having to go back. Um, so currently we're not planning to go back. Um, that's, that's one of those situations where we expect uh, within the next three to four weeks to be in a significantly different place based on the long-term projections. Right. Um, so I would envision that come September that the social distancing uh, in terms of in the classroom would not be an issue. Uh, there still may be some level of physical distancing with masks off, uh, but in the classroom with masks, uh, we don't envision that there being a restrictive measure um, based on the current long-term data and the long-term trend. What will that, um, what is the, the kind of troubleshooting planning for lunch? Because I assume that's a good example of masks off. Mm -hmm. um, how, uh, you know, I'm assuming those, those are talks that are probably going to be happening starting now um, for the next couple of months about how to handle lunch and, and that sort of thing. Those would be handled at the school level. Uh, one of the challenges is uh, supervision. Uh, so making sure that uh, students are supervised within those spaces, um, looking at staffing levels, um, also looking at contractual agreements um, for, uh, for staff, as well as looking at supplemental staff that they have had in the past that we may have lost um, during the shutdown. Uh, and then reestablishing what those needs are in order to make sure that there's a continuum uh, so that lunch um, and snack time is not a barrier to full, full day uh, reopening. So that will be assessed at the school level uh, based on staffing levels at each school and then based on the supplemental staff that schools either uh, still need um, or, or are utilizing in other areas currently. Good. Um, thank you for answering all of our questions. Board members, I don't see any other either actual or virtual hands raised, but does anyone else have any last minute questions that they thought of before uh, we exit our committee of the whole for this evening? Bill, not a one question. <laughs> all right. Um, do I have a motion to exit committee of the whole? So moved. Clinton, so moved. Anna, second. Second. Sarah. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Uh, moving on to section uh, five of our agenda, future dates and, and miscellaneous information. Uh, we only have two uh, dates uh, to to bring you up to speed on. May 22nd is uh, Collingswood Board of Education's uh, first retreat with Dr. McDowell. And uh, then our next board meeting is Monday, May 24th. Uh, we are now, oh, and then section six is uh, routine board business moving on um, to, a, to approve the minutes of the March 15th regular board of education meeting and the March 25th special board of education meeting. Do I have a motion? No moved. And a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'm going to abstain, Heidi Wood. Sure. Uh, our first public comment section is upon us. Uh, if you wish to make a statement, please type your name and address into the chat. When your name is called, you can unmute yourself and please uh, keep your comments to five minutes or less. The purpose for this public comment section is to discuss items listed on the agenda. Additional more general comments may be made later in the meeting. The public is reminded that attempts to resolve all concerns and complaints should first go through appropriate staff members and administrators. The intent of public comment is to give the community opportunity to provide feedback to the board. We will be actively listening and taking notes so that we can take all that is being said into consideration. There will be opportunities to engage in dialogue with Dr. McDowell and board members um, at other times uh, throughout the year. So if you have a comment based on things on the agenda, please type your name into the chat.
Melanie Curtis. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, just one quick comment uh, regarding the question that Roger asked, if I heard correctly, that our, um, I believe the question was, have all families or all students that have requested five days a week at the elementary level are receiving five days a week at the elementary level? And I believe the answer from Dr. McDowell was yes. And I just wanted to comment that at least from the persp- my understanding as a Tatum parent, that that is not true, that we have requested five days a week for a student at the Tatum elementary level, but are receiving hybrid schedule with the two and alternating third day a week. So just wanted to clarify that that is not the case at all elementary schools. And then secondly, just want to quick comment regarding um, not actively planning for the three foot distancing still being a requirement for September that hopefully it's not. um, And there won't be that need to plan which will certainly give much more flexibility but I would feel uh, more confident if someone at the district level was at least doing a very rough quick plan for what could be in place to get all elementary children back in five days a week if the three foot social distancing was required. Um, Whether that be moving classrooms from one elementary school to another where more space is available or different equipment in the classroom such as desks, if that overcomes a barrier or moving students to empty desks in other schools if, if that solves the problem. So um, because the problem is here, because all elementary students aren't back five days a week, um, that I would hope someone at the district level is at least doing some sort of quick plan for that. So again, I apologize if I didn't understand the question and answer, but I believe that's what I heard and just wanted to clarify um, what our experience is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lindsay Oster. Yes, thank you. Um, I kind of wanted to piggyback on what uh, Melanie just said regarding the five days a week. Um, We're at Sharp, and I know that pre-K is not back five days a week, and I don't know how that, um, you know, if, I I know my son is in four and a half-ish days every other Wednesday, but I have friends that were only able to get the two days and every other Wednesday, things like that, Um, and that was based on I guess, pre-K only being allowed to have eight children per class on any given day. So just wanted to, I I understand you guys aren't answering the questions today, but trying to get a better understanding of how we're making it work for those families, especially when sibling or siblings are back in school five days and then the pre-K child is not. Thank you. Um, Ed Bites. Uh, Hi, I just wanted to say to the board members as someone whose son is going back five days um, at Zane, just going going to the school today and seeing the the level of buzz and activity was uh, one of the more beautiful sights I've I've seen in a long time. So to to folks who were involved in in getting us to this place, uh, my thanks and and gratitude. Um, Melanie, and and best for my comment or my question, uh, Melanie and Lindsay really took the words out of my mouth that just um, if if children aren't going to be and I, I I love to be optimistic that that you're right, and that, that and perhaps you have uh, insight to data that I don't have. Um, and, and so certainly, I'm hopeful that three foot distancing or six th- six or three foot distancing won't be necessary in the fall. But you know, again, with children not being vaccinated, and then if hopefully it will be less. But if there's an uptick in cases come the winter months, um, it sure would be nice to be ready to uh, adjust to it to distancing rather than having to shut down um, school just you know parents are going to have to be able to plan and prepare for that so whatever that is if it's you know uh, one stuff it's option that gets tossed around in a lot of discussions is renting um, finding a way to acquire a good shepherd school whatever it is um, it just makes me nervous to go into the fall with uh, just the hope that we won't have the distancing requirement but uh, more to the point you know, the fact that we got as many kids back, at least at Zane, as we did, uh, it's a beautiful thing, uh, and it, it has me feeling encouraged. 
Thank you. Is, I don't see any other names um, in the chat, but giving it like 20 more seconds just in case someone was um, slow to type. So I'm not seeing any more names. Oh, sorry. There we go. Amy Likes. Hi, um, I was just curious um, if we could have any background information as to when the playground at Zane North might be open. I don't think we have that information at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. McDowell, would you like to, um, to speak to, to some of the concerns now that um, all of the, the public comment, we're moving on to the next section, but, but right before we do, just maybe clarify some of the, um, the capacity uh, issues that were brought up. Yes, um, so the first, uh, in this uh, plan around expansion, pre-K was not included. Um, the focus was on kindergarten through grade five. The preschool model, which includes learning stations, um, does not um, uh, allow for, uh, so the removal of the actual learning stations ultimately takes away the purpose of preschool. Uh, so the reason why we did not include preschool in the uh, expansion to the five days a week um, was because of the learning stations um, that take up uh, a considerable space. So in many of our pre-K classrooms, uh, uh, beyond eight uh, 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 or nine, depending on the size of the classroom within that particular school, kind of ties our hands in terms of all students being able to come back. Some classrooms are, are, are larger than others, and some classrooms have less students than others, which is why there's that variation. Um, in terms of... Uh, uh, access at some of our schools. Tatum specifically um, has one of our largest elementary populations. Uh, there are uh, roughly 250 students, whereas some of the other schools are going to have uh, anywhere from 120 to 135 students. So when you look at the number of students participating, um, uh, even with the high numbers of students participating at Tatum, there is still capacity. Uh, so families that have uh, the desire to increase uh, instruction, I would encourage them to follow up directly with Mr. Kulak um, to see what space is available broken down by classroom. So our goal uh, at the beginning um, of this process was to transition as many students as possible from remote to in-person instruction with the goal of transitioning as many students possible to five days of in-person instruction. To varying degrees, we've been able to do this in almost every school based on demand. Uh, there will be some outliers. We know that Tatum has a space issue. Uh, we're currently looking at how do we think creatively at Tatum. Um, so I, I do apologize if I uh, had a statement that was deemed misleading. Uh, and I would just add to um, the, the, you know, the plans for for the fall, you know, we, we will hope for and plan for the best case scenario, but absolutely have contingency plans, as Dr. McDowell has said, you know, many times in the past when all of these discussions have taken place for all of our all of the various um, iterations of this uh, pandemic that could be thrown at us since um, it's it's hard to to predict what what the fall will look like, just like it's hard to predict. Um, it's been this has all kind of been hard to to predict going um, so we're just gonna have to remain flexible with all of it. Um, so all of that being said, thank you to, to everyone um, who spoke. We are moving on to section eight, which is um, something we have to do each year, our annual appointments and approvals. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mrs. Coleman gets the uh, pleasure of reading all of that to us. <laughs> I apologize for the length of this, but I will be as quick as possible. Um, again, like Mrs. Caden said, these are all of our annual appointments, and for one reason or another, we need a board resolution for all of these items on file in the board office, and we send them to multiple state agencies. 
Um, the first item is appointing uh, Garrison Architects as our architect of, of record for the Collingswood School District. We did go out for RFPs and the evaluations of the respondents um, is attached. Um, 8.02, yeah, I'm recommending um, the auditor uh, in Verso and Stort, uh, Dr. Catherine Lambert um, as the, uh, the school doctor and um, Cape Hart and Scatcher and more specifically Joe, Joe Betley, the attorney from Cape Hart and Scatcher uh, to remain as the school district solicitor. Um, 8.03 is appointing Hardenberg Insurance Company as the insurance broker um, and that's for your non-health lines of insurance coverage for next school year. Um, the official banks designated for Collinswood Public Schools um, is gonna remain the first colonial community bank. Um, and then we have um, Wells Fargo is the depository for the Kelshaw um, School Scholarship Fund. Um, the official newspapers for Collingswood will remain the retrospect um, in the Courier Post. Um, 8.06, I'm not gonna list them all, but these are all the bank accounts that we currently have in the district and who, who signs um, on them on your, on your behalf. 8.07 is approving myself as the qualified purchasing agent and establishes the bid threshold at $44,000 per year. 8.08 uh, .08 is just authorizing uh, me to purchase CDs and bank notes um, for investment purposes um, when funds uh, are available. 8.09 is just allowing uh, me to transfer and wire funds uh, by telephone or internet. And that's more specifically, that's how we, um, we fund payroll, um, unemployment, and uh, your, your bond, your bond payments each year. Um, 8.10 is just um, authorizing me to promptly handle all business affairs, including pay, payment of invoices. Um, that may come in between board meeting dates. And typically when I do that, um, I bring it to you at the next board meeting and it's listed in your bills list. Um, 8.11 is just um, authorizing and approving the petty cash fund in the amount of $250. And those funds are redeposited back into the cash account um, by the end of June each year. Uh, 8.12 is approving me as the district custodian of record. And what that means is when we get the OPRA uh, request in the school district, um, I'm the person um, uh, who handles that. 8.13 is uh, approving Keith Higginbotham um, as the school district's asbestos management officer, school and health designee, integrated pest management coordinator, chemical hygiene officer, and asbestos hazardous emergency response act coordinator. Um, 8.14 is uh, approving uh, myself and Keith to act as the school district right to, vote, right to know coordinators for uh, POSHA. 8.15 is approving me as the public agency compliance officer, the PACO. 8.16 is approving Windsor Yamamoto as the compliance action officer responsible for the affirmative action um, plan and any complaints in the school district. 8.17 is approving um, Dr. Elizabeth Whitehouse as the Compliance Action Officer for uh, 504 plans. 8.18 is uh, approving the Omni Group as your third party administrator for the school district's 403 403B investment plans uh, for the employees. 8.19 is approving Denise Saletti in my office as uh, the homeless liaison for the school district. 8.20 is approving myself as um, the officer for um, issuing of working papers. 8.21 is approving Windsor Yamamoto as a Title, um, title IX coordinator. 8.22 is um, <clears throat> approving the school safety and security plan that we have to have on file each year. And that includes the emergency operations plan, crisis prevention and response procedures, and the emergency management plan. 8.23s, um, approving Dr. Elizabeth Whitehouse as the American with Disabilities Act officer for next school year. 8.24 is just approving the collection and maintenance of all the school um, student records in accordance with uh, New Jersey Administrative Code. And the next items, 8.25 through 8.27 is the school district curriculums, uh, grades pre-K to five, grades six to eight, and then high school. 8.28 um, is approving the following special ed programs to be offered um, during next school year. 
8.29 is approving the Twilight Alternative Program in Collingswood. Excuse me. Uh, 8.30 is approving um, the following ed educator practice rubrics um, in accordance with New Jersey Administrative Code. Um, 8.31 is your annual approval of all the school district policies and bylaws that are uh, currently in place and they're all located on uh, the website. 8.32 is setting the, the sub rates um, in the school district and that's for teachers, nurses, tutors, instructional assistants, and secretaries. Um, 8.33 is approving Dr. Karen Principato as the principal of Thomas Sharp Elementary School and the James A. Garfield Elementary School. 8.34 is approving Jen McPartland as the principal of the Mark Newby School. 8.35 is approved. Oh, 8.35 is approving Tom Santo as the principal of the Zane North and William Tatum Elementary Schools. Take a deep breath. So I'm asking for approval for, for items uh, 8.01 through 8.35. Do I have a motion? So moved. And a second. 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 Do I, are there any questions or comments from board members? Roll call, please. Mr. Connor? Yes. Mr. Chu? Yes. Mr. Craig? Yes. Ms. Henry? Yes. Ms. Mello? Yes. Ms. Rivera? Yes. Mrs. Severino? Yes. Ms. Cecilia? Yes. Mr. Stotts? Yes, except those items marked with a double asterisk where I abstain. Mrs. Wood? Yes, except for the items marked with a single or a double asterisk where I abstain. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if I need to abstain from 8.25 and 2.6. Let me look. It's curriculum for elementary? Yes, I would. Okay, so I do. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, and Mrs. Caden. Yes. Uh, moving on to section nine, our superintendent's report, Dr. McDowell. Okay. Uh, 9.01 is the enrollment. Uh, March of 2020, um, enrollment was 2235. Uh, enrollment for March of 2021 is uh, 2208 uh, with the um, attached uh, enrollment reports with the five-year uh, uh, summary. Uh, there are um, attached uh, to 9.02 uh, is the school safety drill report uh, for the month of March. Uh, and then there are no suspensions and no uh, anti-bullying uh, reports uh, this month. Thank you. Moving on to section 10, uh, our student reports. Do we have any of our um, student board members uh, here to, to give us their report. I can't see if anybody's here on my screen. I don't know if anybody else can. I don't see them. Yeah, I don't see that. Okay, so I think for now, or unless, um, it, they put their name in the chat or that they're they're here. We're going to move on because I don't think that they are with us. Uh, so moving on to section 11, the business administrator board secretary report, Mrs. Coleman again. Okay, so 11.01 uh, is your March 2021 uh, report of monthly transfers. 11.02 is your March 2021 secretary and tre treasurer's reports um, and uh, your cash flow analyses. 11.03 is your student activity cash report. 11.04 is your March 2021 uh, NutriServe uh, food service financial statement. 11.05 is the listing of the April 2021 purchase orders that have been issued. And 11.06 is a listing of the warrants that will be paid uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think she froze there a little bit, but I think that was the end, so we're okay. Um, section 12 is the Buildings, Grounds, and Finance Committee report. Um, Matt? Yep, so the, the Finance, Buildings, and Grounds Committee reviews all financial statements, purchase orders, and warrants on a monthly basis. The committee also reviews and approves all contracts with outside service providers and oversees all maintenance and capital improvement projects district-wide. So we've got a few things for, will be up for approval tonight. Uh, the first few, just 
from um, Ms. Coleman's report, approval of transfer, board secretary certifications is 1203, uh, 1204 board certification of no over expenditures in the monthly financial report, uh, 1205 our approval of the student activities report, uh, 1206 approval of the secretary and treasurer reports, 07 approval of food service and financial statements, uh, 1208 approval of purchase orders, 1209 warrant approvals. Uh, 1210 is approval of the budget that was presented uh, in the Committee of the Whole. 1211 is the uh, approval of the following resolution um, where uh, as the Committee, the Board of Ex Education approves Superintendent Fred, Dr. Fred McDowell as authorized representative and Douglas Newman and Beth Coleman as the contact persons for the elementary and secondary Education ESSEA Act formal subgrant for the allocations on behalf of the districts, um, with the the amounts uh, listed there for for each. Uh, Twelve two school and health insurance fund renewal. Um, just stating again, whereas we will be approving the renewal of our school health insurance fund. Twelve thirteen. Um, moving on the recommendation from the superintendent to set lunch prices for 21-22 school year as follows. Um, Twelve fourteen is recommendation from superintendent and the board to approve continuation of following services provided by Camden County Education Services Commission for the following school year. Um, so PL 192-93, special education transportation, vocational transportation, and CST evaluations on an as-needed basis. 1215 is moving on. Recommendation of the contract for ESSS, the Educational Staffing Services, as paraprofessional staffing service provider for the following school year at a rate of $122.55 per aid per day. 1216, renewal of Archway programs, um, Just Kids before and after school programs for the next school year. 1217, uh, approval of Maribel Wilson to provide bilingual speech education, uh, bilingual speech evaluations in Spanish at the rate of 900 per evaluation on an as needed basis. Um, I don't know, Bethany, is this supposed to say 21, 22 school year or is this for the rest of this year? I believe it's for the rest of this year. I can find out um, if it's for next year as well. Okay. So for now, just approving for the rest of the school year. Um, 1218, um, recommendation to approve Phoenix Advisors LLC as the continuing disclosure agent and independent registered municipal advisor for the 21-22 school year. 1219, um, is the food service management contract with NutriServe Food Management at a rate of $50,980.92 for the following school year. Prior rate was um, just below that at $50,485.96, 1 percent increase. And year three of the five year contract. 2020 is the um, Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act grant to New Jersey Department of Education with from the New Jersey Department of Education. Um, this is approving these amounts here. Um, this is what we are. This is what we're applying for. Yeah, this is our. This is what we're entitled to. The grant applications are actually due in the middle of May. In the middle. Of May. So, and they most likely will need a date that it was approved by the board when we upload the grant. So, thank you. Twelve twenty one is moving on the recommendation to void outstanding checks from the warranty agency payroll and student activities accounts as that is attached. 1222 is um, approval of the middle school, middle school Saturday credit restoration to use the high school cafeteria on Saturdays from March 27th uh, through the end of the school year, exception of May 8th and June 5th. So approving um, the use of that space for the rest of the school year. Um, moving 1223 um, request, this is cleaning up a request from uh, Odyssey of the Mind to use this a North All Purpose Room from March 29th, and making sure that we have that approved all on the books. Uh, 1224 is approved, will be approving elementary PE teachers and elementary PTA consortium to use the Collingswood football field Friday, June 4th, um, 
for elementary schools, fourth and fifth grade track and field day. So excited that we'll have that back. And then 1225, um, moving again on the, on the recommendation for to use the high school track archery, high school track for archery events on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays from 4.30 to 8.30 from June 8th, June 28th through July 28th. And that is working with the Collingswood Borough Recreational Program. So I am seeking approval on those items from 1202 to 1225. Thank you, Mr. Craig. Do we have a motion for approval? So moved. So moved. And a second? Second. Questions or comments from board members? A quick, quick question about um, just the lunch prices thing. Uh, Dr. Dow, you had mentioned that uh, that the I guess the, f the the meal program for this year would be extending to June of next year. Any idea how that would work with uh, lunch prices once kids are back in school, not, instead of like picking up food uh, outside so, school time? So right now, so we have we go through the process of establishing annual lunch rates. Um, they are frozen based on last year's rate. However, um, we received notification from the uh, USDA that um, we will be able to provide uh, food service at no cost um, to families, regardless of eligibility. They're going to continue that. Originally, it was supposed to go through September. They're going to continue it through um, for another year through June of 2022 as part of the American uh, Rescue Plan support and stimulus. So in all, in essentially in practical manner, the, the, the cost for kids will be, will be zero. That's correct. Awesome. Thank you. And I put the, I put these prices on here because I still have to complete an application with the New Jersey Department of Agriculture. And usually they ask me to break it down school by school and the price is charged, you know, at each grade level. I don't know if they're going to change the application this year. So I want to just be able to have it in case they still ask for the application to have it on file. Cause that's what they did last year. You completed the application and then everybody's just free. So I wasn't sure. So this just kind of is covering us. Wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. Syria, did you have a question? No, actually, I was just going to state what oh. Dr. McDowell just stated about the free lunches for all students. Okay. Any other questions or comments from board members? Roll call, please. Mr. Connor? Yes. Mr. Chu? Yes. Mr. Craig? Yes. Ms. Henry? Yes, except for 1214, where I believe I'm conflicted, so I'll abstain. Ms. Mello? Yes. Ms. Rivera? Yes. Mrs. Severino? Yes. Ms. Cecilia? Yes. Mr. Stotts? Yes. Mrs. Wood? Yes, I'm going to abstain from 1222 to 1225, just in case I have to. Got it. Mrs. Caden? Yes. And we're moving on to section 13, the curriculum committee, Ms. Saverino. So the curriculum committee oversees and approves the district curriculum and assessment programs, as well as all field trips, home instruction, co-curricular programs, and the school calendar. So at this time, there are no elementary field trips, no middle school field trips. There is one high school uh, field trip that is listed, and that is Mr. King taking some 12th graders to the barns. Um, sorry, 1305 is approval of the high school musical, which is Into the Woods, and it's that is going to be happening May 21st, 22nd, and 23rd, and it's going to be held outside, um, hmm. which is great. Um, 13.06, no uh, elementary home instructions. 13.07, there, there is, I believe, one there. Yes, one home instruction. Um, this is a question that I have for uh, Dr. McDowell or uh, Ms. Coleman. I don't see those uh, courses on the um, agenda. So would it be best to say in 13.08 that... Uh, the development of the three courses, is that where to seek approval there? Because I don't see them listed. They were actually placed, and I apologize, they were placed under all of the curriculum under the high school. So let me. Okay. Should be social studies. Here's those two right here. Can you see, can you see my screen? 
Yeah, yeah I know. I know what the, what they are. Yeah. I just didn't know yeah. where, where I should ask for approval of them. Okay, they were already approved up in here, so. So I don't need to ask for approval of the development Correct. of the curriculum. Correct. Yeah, we just gotcha. put in with all the uh, high school approval, so it's all it's all in one list. Okay, I thought that was. So I apologize. Yeah, we did that today okay. after we got your email. So. That's okay. That's not a problem. Yep, I just wanted there. to make sure I was covering everything. Yep. Okay. So looking for approval of items 13.04 to 13.07. Thank you, Ms. Severino. Do we have a motion for approval? So moved. And a second? Second. Questions or comments from board members? I thought that we were waiting to see some language on at least one of the courses. Am I remembering that wrong? I, I believe uh, that Dr. McDowell is going to be ensuring that that language is in the um, is it is within the courses uh, before they right. go forward. So we're just approving the development of the courses and then correct. The, yes. That's Thank correct. you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Connor. Yes. Mr. Chu. Yes. Mr. Craig? Yes. Ms. Henry? Yes. Ms. Mello? Yes. Ms. Rivera? Yes. Mrs. Severino? Yes. Cecilia? Yes. Mr. Stotts? Yes, except those items marked with a double asterisk or I abstain. Mrs. Wood? Yes. Mrs. Caden? Yes. And we are moving on to section 14, which is um, quite a whopper this evening. <laughs> the personnel committee, Ms. Sheridan Celia, take it away. Uh, hi, good, good evening. Yes, so we have a very large agenda today, um, which I'll try to move through at a expedient uh, rate here. Uh, the personnel committee reviews all recommendations for teaching and staff employment, considers co-curricular employment, and considers all professional development opportunities for staff members. Um, we're seeking approval for the following agenda items. We have a retirement at 14.02, Paula Trapezano, who is a high school special ed teacher. 14.03, the retirement of Thomas Ray, who is a finance buildings and grounds employee and the last, and the res several resignations. 14.04 um, through 14.06 are three resignations. There are several um, leaves of absences, 14, which are encompassed from 14.07 through 14.11. Um, there's an appointment of a new high school Spanish teacher at 14.12 um, and long-term substitute 14.13, 14.14, another long-term sub, 14.14 uh, and 14.15 and a permanent substitute at 14.16. Um, and 14.17 um, is the as needed appointment of employee of personnel to staff Saturday school detention for the school year, 14.18 and, and through 14.20 are various athletic stipend, stipends approvals. 14.21 is the athletic events personnel list. It's a revision from a prior meeting. Uh, 14.22 and 14.23 are student teachers clinical placements. And the next list are things that we have to go through every year with appointing personnel. So this is another routine thing like Beth Ann had to do earlier. 14.24 is the listing of the preschool through grade five teaching staff tenured. The 14.25 is the non-tenured preschool through grade five teaching staff. 14.26 um, is a grade six through grade eight teaching staff with tenure. And 14.27 is the non-tenure teaching staff from grade six through grade eight. 14.28 is the district high school teaching staff with tenure. And 14.29 is approval of the listing of the district high school teaching staff who are non-tenured. 14.30, preschool through grade five office surface personnel 12 month personnel with tenure. 14.31 are the 10 month preschool through grade five office service personnel tenured. 14.32 uh, are the non tenured preschool 10 month grade five, preschool through grade five 10 month employees. 14.33, the grade six through grade eight office service personnel or 12 months without tenure. 
1434 through 36 are various um, high school staff. 1434 is the 12 month tenured staff. Thir 1435 is the 10 month tenured staff and 13, I'm sorry, 1436 of the 10 month non-tenured staff approvals. Um, administrative staff are next, 1437 preschool through grade five administrative staff with tenure, 14.38 grade six through grade eight administrative staff with tenure, 1439 high school district administrative staff tenured and 1440 high school district administrative staff non-tenured. 14.41 and 14.42 are approval for summer hours for secretaries. 14.41 are the 10 month elementary secretaries and 14.42 extra summer hours for 10 month high school secretaries. 14.43 is uh, seeking approval for the student family liaison for the next school year. 14.44 are custodial transfers within the buildings and grounds department. 14.45, seeking to re recognize various retiring fact faculty and staff. And they are Ms. Ann Gross with 24 and a half years of service. Carol Johnson served the district for 30 years. Al Hurd, 19 years. Um, Barbara Phillips was also 19 years. Mr. Ria, who we just read his retirement has been here for 30 years. And um, Ms. Schaefer, 29 years. So we do wanna thank all of them. Um, 14.46, there are no travel expense forms. And um, Beth Ann, again, I think we're just at 14.49 and we're seeking approval of items 14.02 to 14.46, because there are other things that haven't been That's filled correct. Out. Yeah, okay. they didn't get done, so yeah, correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yes, we are seeking approval of items 14.02 through 14.46. Uh, thank you very much, um, Ms. Sharon and Celia. Do we have a motion for approval? So moved. And a second? Second. Any questions or comments from board members? A comment about um, the recognition for uh, retirement, retiring uh, faculty and staff. I think wasn't a 14.02 uh, also another retirement. I just wanted to make sure that we recognize uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Trapuzano as well. Uh, that is a good question. Is that for, does that fall under a different um, time frame, Beth Ann, or, or are we able to add uh, that on? Yeah, no, she'll, she'll be added. Um, the people that were on the list um, in Fort, uh, I forgot what an item that was, uh, have already left the district. Uh, Ms. Trapezano is finishing out the school year. So there will be another, we, another list yeah, of recognition. We, we will make sure that she's, she's acknowledged for sure. Uh, thank you. Any other questions or comments from board members? Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Connor? Uh, he had to uh, leave because he had a family emergency. Oh, okay. Thank you. Mr. Chu? Yes. Mr. Craig? Yes. Ms. Henry? Yes. Ms. Mello? Yes. Ms. Rivera? Yes. Mrs. Severino? Yes. Ms. Cecilia? Yes. Mr. Stotts? Yes, except those items marked with a double asterisk where I abstain. Mrs. Wood? Yes, except for the items marked with a single or a double asterisk where I abstain. Mrs. Caden? Yes. And uh, moving on to section 15, policy and regulations committee. I will um, run through this uh, because uh, Mr. Connor had to go. Um, the committee statement is the policy and regulations committee reviews all updates and changes of district policies and regulations. 15.02 uh, is a first reading of three policies um, that we've uh, already discussed in our committees. 15.03 uh, is a second reading of the policies from last month's agenda. And 15.04 is uh, a, a couple of regulations that just require one reading. Most of them are already um, are regulations that go with some of the second reading policies. Some of them are first reading ones. Uh, so we are looking for approval of items 15.02 to 15.04 this evening. Do I have a motion? So moved. And a second? Second. Any questions or comments from board members? Roll call, please. Mr. Chu. Yes. 
Mr. Craig? Yes. Ms. Henry? Yes. Ms. Mello? Yes. Ms. Rivera? Yes. Mrs. Severino? Yes. Ms. Celia? Yes. Mr. Stotts? Yes. Mrs. Wood? Yes. Mrs. Caden? Yes. Uh, section 16 miscellaneous uh, has the HIB reports from the previous month, but we don't have any reported. So we are going to move right along to section 17, uh, which is our second opportunity for uh, public participation. Uh, again, if you wish to make a statement, type your name and address into the chat. When your name is called, please unmute yourself to speak and keep your comments to five minutes or less. This uh, is a more general public participation section, so it does not have to be uh, about items listed on the agenda. Um, the public is reminded that attempts to resolve all concerns and complaints should first go through appropriate staff members and administrators. And the intent of public comment is to give the community the opportunity to provide feedback to the board. So we will be actively listening and taking notes. Um, and there will be other opportunities to engage in dialogue with us. Um, so all of that being said, if you would like to make a comment, please type your name into the chat. Jaywa. Oh, <clears throat> thanks, Reagan. Uh, just something came up tonight that, um, you know, that was on one of the agenda items from Beth Ann. I think it was in the eight. Um, just the one where you approve, you know, architect, solicitor, everybody that goes through the list. There was one that came up that you're approving the special education programs. Um, and I was just thinking, and, you know, being on the board before and probably going through the same list never came up before, but that that should be separated out into either curriculum or it should be um, presented with the annual plan of curriculum. It seems like we're just minimizing, um, you know, a, a whole population of students by throwing it into that, um, you know, agenda item where you just go, go through a list. Um, that's all. I just, you know, something that I point out and maybe we can get it moved to, you know, a more appropriate area with that's more student based. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We will um, look into that. Are there any other questions or uh, comments? Excuse me. I am not seeing any other names in the chat. So I, at this time, I'm gonna say we're gonna move on to uh, a motion to adjourn our meeting. So moved. And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good evening. Good night, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.